you uh, where we've been, been thus far and pick it up for just a few moments uh, this morning. We're talking about God's game plan for victory in the home. God gave these Ten Commandments two different times in the Word of God here in the book of Exodus chapter 20 and also in the book of Deuteronomy. The second time when he gave them in the book of Deuteronomy, he commanded and commissioned and challenged moms and dads, and especially dads, to be honest, to teach those things unto their children, all right? And uh, just remind you again, the primary classroom for the teaching of the Ten Commandments is the home. The primary teacher is not the Sunday school teacher or the pastor, but is mom and dad. And the classroom is the home, and the student or the pupil is the children. And so my challenge and my desire is to teach you these that you would teach them and keep on teaching them to your children and to your grandchildren. Well, if we're going to have victorious Christian homes, it all starts with number one. And I was reminded as I was studying this week that not only is God, every, every word in God's word perfect, it's also in perfect order. And you have the Ten Commandments, and not only are they Ten Commandments and every word of them is true, you have a Ten Commandment in perfect order. And the first commandment is the most important, and that is we must have God in his rightful place. And really, the truth of the matter is you'll never have anything else in place until you get God in his rightful place. And uh, that's where you start, getting God in his rightful place. And then second of all, we preached about worship. You need to have worship in its rightful place. Let me say again, for emphasis sake, everybody worships. People say, well, I'm not religious. That's not true. Everybody's religious. Everybody worships, and everybody is a believer. The question is, what do you believe, and who or what do you worship? You must have worship in its rightful place, worshiping God. Number three, then, we talked about God's name. You need to have God's name in its rightful place. And every commandment has a negative and a positive side. The power in a battery is the negative and the positive together. The power in a Christian life is the negative and the positive working together. So you don't take it in vanity, but you do take his name in victory, praise his name, share his name, and glorify his name. And then last week, we preached about God's day in its rightful place. God has given us a day. It's called the Lord's Day, and it's about to be the greatest day of the week. It'll be the best day of the week, and if we will do what God wants us to do in that day, it will be a joy and a delight to us. Now, today we're going to preach about the fifth commandment, and it's in Exodus chapter number 20, and look at verse number 12, where the word of God says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So I've been preaching on this thought, God's, uh, God, God in his rightful place, worship in his rightful place, his name in his rightful place, his day in his rightful place. Now number five. If we're going to have victorious Christian homes, father, father and mother must be in their rightful place. Father and mother in their rightful place. Now go with me in your mind to this thought real quickly. The first four commandments deal with God. Now the last six, you could say it this way. The first four commandments are this, God and us. The last six commandments are us with other people. Don't miss that. What comes first? This. All right? If I want this to be right, I need this to be right. As a matter of fact, when this isn't right, it's an indication not that this is the problem. This is the problem. Right? I need to get right with the Lord. And when God is in his rightful place, then others will be in their rightful place. And so we're going to talk about mom and dad in their rightful place. Now, I keep pretty good notes of what I preach. I preach honor thy father and thy mother. On Mother's Day, 2022, about a year and a half ago. And in that message, and you can go back, and I'm sure it's on our YouTube channel, and you can go back and listen to that. I dealt with primarily uh, the children to the parents, how we can honor our father and our mother. Today, I want to turn it 180 degrees, and I want to preach on this thought, how to be honorable parents. How to be honorable parents. Now, if you say to me, Pastor... Uh, my children ought to honor me whether I'm honorable or not. I would agree with that. But I will say this, that you are to be honorable uh, 
in your life. Amen? God wants us to be God-honoring, and we ought to be honorable no matter what. Now, and it's interesting that God makes a distinction about obeying mom and dad and honoring mom and dad. We are to obey our parents while we are in the home. Amen to that, right? We are to obey them while we are in their home, all right? But we are preparing our children to do what? To leave, all right? That's what we're preparing our children to do, to leave father and mother and cleave unto their spouse that they would be one flesh. That's the goal, all right? And uh, so when that happens, no longer do they obey us, but they should honor us all of our life. And by the way, you say, well, uh, uh, Pastor, my parents uh, are deceased. Well, can I say this? Still honor your parents sure. by the way that you live. Honor them as best you can with <coughs> the Lord's help, all right? Exodus chapter 20, verse number 12, honor thy father and thy mother. Now, God has given us families for three basic reasons. First of all, obviously, for living. That makes sense. Number two, God has given us families for learning. These commandments were given to the home and again, not primarily to the church. These commandments were not primarily given to the schools. And I remember years ago, a few years ago, people got all worked up about the Ten Commandments being taken down from places. Now listen, that's not the greatest problem we have. The greatest problem is that we're, we don't know them in our homes and we're not living them in our homes. That's the great problem. Not that they're taking off some wall somewhere uh, uh, in a public place. But, we, but the question is, do we know them and are we teaching them to our children and to our grandchildren? All right, so uh, God has given us families for living. God has given us families for learning. And God has given us families for lasting. He says that thy days, verse number 12, may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that we are absolutely in big trouble in our country. And the problem, the reason we're in big trouble in our country is it's a problem of the home. Not primarily a problem of government, although there's plenty of that. Not primarily a problem of Hollywood, there's, a pro there's plenty of that. And anywhere you look, and I'm telling you what, the foundation is the home. The foundation is the family. So I want to challenge parents today to be the right kind of parents that our children can honor. Are you a parent? If you're a mom or a dad here today, are you a parent worthy of honor? Now, before I get started, let me say this, that there are no perfect parents. Amen to that. Amen. No perfect parents. You don't agree with that? Well, get your children up to testify. Amen. No perfect parents. And there's no children that are perfect either. All right. And may I say this, you cannot guarantee, you cannot guarantee how your children are going to turn out. Amen. God has a lot of children. Most of his aren't doing very good. I know one of them that struggles more than he would like. Maybe I was going to join me on that. And you know what? I have a perfect parent. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Uh, there have been people, and I, and I thank God for Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child, and the way he should go. When he is old, he'll not depart from it. I thank God for that verse. The truth of the matter is there are some people that have just beaten people over the head with that verse. Yeah. That is a proverb. A general principle, generally applied, brings a general result. That is a proverb. Yeah. Right. Is it called Proverbs? It's called Proverbs, all right? You see, you need to understand, a proverb is a proverb. A promise is a promise. A precept is a precept. A parable is a parable. A prophecy is a prophecy. Sadly, there are some people who have put themselves in an early grave because of a wayward child. Here's the truth of the matter is, all right? And I've seen this. I have seen this firsthand. I've seen this very close to home. That you can have two kids. They get the same thing from the same parents. One child just loves that parent and receives that and lives for God. And the other person just hates it and despises it and doesn't live for God. Same parents, same training. You see, here's the thing. God has given everybody a free will. Yeah. Amen. Again, last time I checked, God had two kids in the, in the garden of Eden. They didn't turn out too good. It's amen right there. Amen. All right, it's, this is a proverb. All right, here's the thing. If you take the Proverbs... And turn them into promises. You'll lose your faith. All right. There are proverbs that will tell you how to be wealthy. Does that mean everybody that follows them is going to be wealthy? Hey, listen. Some of the greatest people that I know that love God and serve God don't have two cents to rub together. 
That's just the truth. All right? It's a proverb. A proverb, again, a general principle, generally applied, brings a general result. There's a proverb that says, an earthly proverb, that says what? Early to bed, early to rise, will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Okay, but you may get run over by a truck. <coughs> Amen? You can go to bed early and still get run over by a truck. I understand that. I, I heard uh, one parent say this, and I thought it was really good. I heard a dad say this. He said that he did not have goals for his children. He had desires. He said, I have goals for me. I have desires for my children. I thought that was so good. He said, you know why? He said, because I cannot control my children. But he said, you know who I can control with God's help? This guy. Right? He said this. He said, my desire is, my desire is that my children live for God. My goal is that I live for God. Now, here's the thing. Yes, I mean, there are things, and, uh, and, and there are many parents that are to blame for their children. And I understand that. But here's the thing. Kids have free will. All right? And so thank God for the Proverbs. Thank God for the Word of God that will tell us how to raise our children. May I say this before we get into the message this morning? Don't hey listen, don't don't pretend to your to your children that you're perfect. Right. Amen. Hey, news flash. They already know you're not perfect. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And by the way, you some of you could help your kids and grandkids by saying two words. I'm sorry. Yeah. What? Why is it that we have to, hey, Johnny, you tell Susie you're sorry. Why do we expect that from our children? You say, I've never apologized to my kids. Well, if you give me their names and addresses after church, I'll apologize to them for you. Amen. You make mistakes. Amen. 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 I make mistakes. I've had to go to my kids before and say, hey, dad was wrong. Uh, I've dealt with things before I heard the whole matter on something. <laughs> say, hey, I was wrong. Heaven, calm down back there. Heaven's about ready to take some laps. Amen. But anyways. <laughs> They're not perfect. Hey, listen, your kids aren't interested in you being perfect. You know what they're interested in? You being real and genuine. And one of the most real and genuine things you can do is say, you know what? I messed up. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I messed up. I'm sorry. Forgive me. By the way, they'll learn far more from your stakes, mistakes if you're honest about them and you apologize to them, apologize to your wife, apologize to your husband, apologize mostly to God. They will learn far more from that than your phony perfectionism. Amen. Now, how can we live honorable before our children? Five simple things. You ready? Number one. Number one, love them. Love your kids. I'm going to give you a principle under all five of these. Principle number one under loving them is this. Write it down somewhere. Love is not giving them what they want. Love is giving them what they need. Let me say that again. Love is not giving your children what they want. Love is giving them what they need. Amen to that. Give them what they need. Now, let me give you some ways you ought to love your children. Number one, touch them. Hug them. Kiss him. He said, Preacher, why don't you get in the Bible? Okay, thank you. Luke chapter 15, verse number 20. You ever heard of the story of the prodigal son? You ever heard that story? How I many of you have heard of that story? You know what that father did? Hugged him and kissed him. By the way, I wonder how he smelled at that point. Hello? wonder how he looked at that point. Hello? Right, if you think he smelled like a bed of roses, you wrong. You know what he smelled like? He smelled like kissing a, a horse manure trough. Luke 15, 20. Speaking of the prodigal. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. By the way, who was telling that story? You may have heard of him. His name's Jesus. Here's a grown man. By the way, and this, this father and son, this son's a grown man who'd been backslidden. Jesus spoke of doing this with approval. This is what we are supposed to do. Can I say it? One of the best ways to keep your kids pure is to show affection to them. 
Your young people, your kids, if you don't show affection to them, somebody will. And end up being the wrong person. Someone you don't want them giving that. And listen, hug your children often. Hug your children affectionately. Hug your children supportively. And hug your children tenderly. You say, well, preacher, I got teenagers. Yeah, I do too. And they act like they don't like it. Yeah, I understand that. He said, preacher, what should you do? Hug them anyways. <laughs> Amen? Honestly. Hug them anyways. By the way, moms and dads, your children ought to see you hugging each other. Hallie hates <laughs> to see Nikki and I kiss each other. That's just another good reason. Amen? <laughs> I get a good kiss, and it grosses up my daughter. You know what I call that? Win-win. Amen. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, all right. Our kids to see us loving each other. Can I say this? Many young ladies who get in immoral sexual relationships do so because they cannot remember a time when their father showed them affection and love to them. Unaffectionate dad, dads can trigger a daughter's promiscuity by not showing affection. Hey, listen, your kids desire affection. Your kids desire affirmation. Your kids desire appreciation. And if they don't get it from you, they will get it. I promise you. And I say this, they will emulate your example with their family someday if you do and or if you don't do. Now, so I said, number one, we ought to love them by touching them. Number two, we ought to love them by comforting them. Can I say this? Don't laugh at your children when their heart is broken by a broken toy or a <coughs> pet that dies. I say <coughs> pet because I remember I went through a stage, everything's a pet. And then I had a pet fly one time. Mom, do you, Mom, do you remember my pet fly? I had to pet everything. Anything that I could catch that was living and breathing and some that weren't, I made a pet out of it. It was a cage for everything. Amen? Honestly, I went through that. Hey, you know what? Can I just say this, moms and dads? It'd be good to remember what you went through as a kid. Yeah. Amen? Well, I didn't act like that. Really? Are you that far gone in your mind? You did act like that. My wife says to me all the time, she said, I'm glad I didn't know you when you were a teenager. I would have never married you. That's the truth. Amen. Hey, listen, we go through things. Comfort them. Hey, they hurt. And can I say this? When they hurt, their pain is just as real to them as it your pain is to you. Why is your pain real and their pain not? Hey, listen, comfort them. Number three, love them by listening to them. And I mean listen. Don't cut them off mid-sentence. Mom, Dad, I got, oh, no, 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 that's what you need to do. Oh, no, 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 You ever done that? I've been guilty of that a time or two. Anybody else want to join me? Shh. Just listen. You say, well, they want to talk at midnight. Okay. Amen. Count the cost. Listen to them. One of the finest form of a communication is saying nothing. Just listen. Amen. Number four. I already kind of covered this, so I'll give it to you again. You ought to love them steadfastly and consistently. Let them go through the stages of growing up. They're kids. You know, we live in a, in a society today, man, we want it, and we want it like yesterday. Let them go through the stages. Let them go through the things. And love them through those things steadfastly and consistently. And the last thing I'll say on this, although you can say a million things, love them with your prayers. Pray for them. Pray, pray, pray. And when you're done praying for them, pray for them some more. The most loving thing I think you can do for your kids and grandkids is pray for them. Love them. Number two, you ready? Be an honorable mom and dad by loving your children. Number two. Be an honorable mom and dad by lifting them. Lifting them. What's the principle on lifting them? It's this. Wise encouragement is better than lavish praise. Wise encouragement is better than lavish praise. Listen to Colossians 3 verse 21. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. God would not tell us not to discourage our kids if it were not possible to discourage our kids. We ought to encourage our children. Can I say this? Don't just get on to your children when they do wrong. Praise them when they do right. 
Why is it when they do 10 things, and again, I'm preaching as much to me today. Why is it when they do 10 things and they do one thing wrong, they never hear a word of gratitude on the nine things. They only hear about the one thing. Amen. Praise them when they do right. Again, your kids will feed off that encouragement. They want to hear that praise. They want to hear that encouragement. That will strengthen them and that will encourage them. Lift them with encouragement. Number three. Very important number three. Limit them. Love them. Lift them. Number three, limit them. What's the principle on this? Number three is it takes firm restrictions to set children free. It takes firm restrictions to set children free. All right? It is your responsibility to liberate them by limiting them. 1 Samuel 3, verse 13. The Bible says of Eli. He says, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. He didn't set limits. He said, well, preacher, I just love my kids so much that I don't limit them. That's a lie. You don't have a problem with loving them. You have a problem with loving you too much. Limit them. Your children need limits. And Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. You know what God did? He gave them limits. Give your children limits. And let me say this, parents. They will be tested. They will be tested over and over again. And let me say this. They will push against those limits. And if they move, your children will have no security. If they move, if you're this way one day and this way one day, you think, well, that's what my kids want. No, friend, that's exactly the opposite of what your kids really want. Could, 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 what, kind of, what kind of nervous wreck would I be if I got into my car and one day the brakes went and so one day it didn't? And one day it turned and one day it didn't. What if I went over to my house and one day the wall was there and someday the wall was over here. Someday there was a floor and someday it wasn't there. I'd be a nervous wreck. Amen? Yeah. I'm going down the road in my car. I'm nervous. Wreck. Is it going to work or is it not? Is, it, is, is, is this what it does? Now listen, friend. That's what it is with kids. Kids need to have limits. Set the limits. When I say this, when you set limits, make sure they are firm and reasonable. One way is you provoke your children to wrath. All right, Johnny, before tomorrow, you're going to read, you're going to memorize 927 verses. Go. Well, be reasonable. Amen. And I want to say this as well. Rules without relationship brings rebellion. Yeah. Your kids will be okay with the, with the rules if you have if, if all you're ever doing is <laughs> no, have a relationship with them. Rules, and if you love them, that will have security. I want to say this. Your desire is to conquer your children's will. If you don't, somebody else will. Right. Number four. I said, love them. Number two, lift them. Number three, limit them. Number four, lead them. Lead them. Here's the principle. Don't just teach, train. Proverbs 22, verse six says, train up a child. The key word there is training. All right? It's amazing. We train our dogs, but not our kids. Then we tie up the dog at night and then let our kids run wild. Think about that for a minute. Train your children. No, get in there with them and train them. Train them. Train them in the areas of character. Let me give you some words that uh, think about. These words parents ought to be teaching their children. Think about these words for a minute. Uh, contentment. Courage. Courtesy. Discernment. Fairness. Friendliness, generosity, gentleness, helpfulness, honesty, humility, kindness, obedience, orderliness, patience, persistence, tactfulness, thankfulness, thriftiness, and wisdom. Isn't that a pretty good list to teach your kids? And again, whose job is that, mom and dads? 
mom and dads. And let me say this, mom and dad, learn to compliment character more than talent. Yeah. Learn to compliment character more than talent. I'd much rather have a, a child of character than a child of talent. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's what character is what lasts. Train them. Train them. Don't just say, yeah, right. do that. Teach them. Train them. Do it with them. Number five, and lastly, I said love them. Two, lift them. Three, limit them. Four, lead them. And number five, are you ready? Laugh with them. Mm. Laugh with them. Serious situation. Here's the principle. Serious situations call for a lot of laughter. Mm. The Bible says that laughter is good like a medicine. Mm. My friend, your, auto, your home ought to be filled with laughter right. and joy. Let your home be filled with that. God has so much to say about a merry heart. You know, the human being is the only creation of God that can do three things. Laugh, weep, and blush. Right? Let your kids see you laugh. And by the way, let them see you laugh at your own mistakes. Amen? What a dumb thing I just did. It's all right. Again, they already know you're not perfect. Hey, let your home be fun. I heard someone say this. Every home ought to be firm, fair, and fun. That's pretty good. Firm, have some rules. Be fair, don't treat children one better than the other. And then have a place of fun. Let it, hey, listen, let them raid the refrigerator. Let them put fingerprints on the door. Amen? It's okay. I remember years ago, we had had Hadley. Hadley is very little. I want to say, and Nikki would remember, probably mom remembers the dates. Mom and, mom and Nikki keep me better. I remember events. I don't remember the, the times. I remember how it was very little. And I remember a, a dear pastor, a uh, friend of ours down in West Virginia, the Cumberlands. Mom knows them well. Uh, and, and if you know Brother Mark Wagner down the road here at Hannistown, uh, being his wife Elizabeth's parents. Well, they told us how it was very little about a little child, a little baby that was getting ready to be born that the mother couldn't take care of the child and would we come down and pray about him. So we drove, got Hallie in the car, and drove down to West Virginia that day. I'll never forget this. We didn't end up, God, God didn't will us to have that child. And about a year later, God gave us Evan. And, and Evan's better than whoever that was anyways. Say amen, amen to Evan to that, amen. But anyways, but I'll never forget that day. We're sitting there in the living room of Mrs. Cumberland. And you can see her her glass her her, her uh, sliding glass door <clears throat> in her living room, and on that door, are you listening? From about I, from about here down, was covered with fingerprints. <laughs> you know who those fingerprints were? Her grandkids. You know what she said? She said, "I don't clean that glass." She said, "Because that's some of the prettiest pictures of my grandkids." that I have. I never forgot that. That's been 14, 15 years ago. Let your children, let your home be a happy place. Let your house ring with laughter. Let them see you laugh even in times of trouble because God is in control of it all. I finished with a story this morning. In 1993, 1993, in the Baseball Hall of Fame, they were renovating some of the displays there at the Baseball Hall of Fame there in Cooperstown. When they moved one of the displays of one of the famous baseball pit players, they found a picture and a note attached to that picture, and it was underneath one of the displays. One of, somebody that was visiting Cooperstown, visiting the Baseball Hall of Fame, and had actually had, had evidently slid that into where that display was. And the picture was of a, a man, somebody's dad, with a baseball uniform on. And here's what the note said. The note said, you were never too tired to play ball. On your days off, you helped to build the little league field. You always came to watch me play. You were a Hall of Fame dad. And I wish I could share this moment with you. 
And somebody had just slid that picture of their dad next to the picture of the famous baseball player. You know what that child was saying, that person was saying? Here's who the real Hall of Fame person is, and that's my dad. And while all these people were making millions of dollars playing baseball, my dad was there for me and spent time with me. And he's a Hall of Fame dad. You know what? I'd like to be a Hall of Fame dad, amen? I want you to be a Hall of Fame dad and a Hall of Fame mom, a Hall of Fame parent. But when the Bible says children honor your parents, I want to make that easier on them. I do. Say, so preacher, how do you begin to honor your earthly parents? Well, it all goes back to God. How do you begin to be honorable to your children? I'll say this. It starts by honoring the heavenly father. It starts by knowing him as savior. I, I miss my dad. Say, preacher, you're crying. Yeah. I'm crying when I wrote this message to you. In my office, I cry. I'm thankful to see my daddy someday. Rick, folks, I'm glad you'll see your dad someday. All because of Jesus. I'll never forget your testimony. I'm, I'm sorry, brother. I probably, probably shouldn't do this, but this is what preachers shouldn't do. Call out people that just lost their parents. But remember you remember you're telling your testimony of your dad on New Year's Eve going to church, getting saved going to church instead and getting saved and your mom getting saved. Praise God. Praise God. I'm glad my dad got saved. I'm glad that the things my dad was before he got saved I only knew about from stories and pictures. It's not the dad I knew. My dad loved the Lord. I look forward to seeing him someday. My dad wasn't perfect. His kids aren't perfect. Well, he's got one perfect son. That's one in heaven, amen, but we'll digress there. Not perfect. But dad loved the Lord. Every time those church doors were open, he was there. I watched my dad go through. And by the way, parents, your kids will watch you more in difficult times than they will in easy times to see if it's real. I watched my dad go through a financial reverse. About lose everything he had. And I watched my dad every single Sunday, as was his custom before he had financial reverse, and when he had that financial reverse, and after he had that financial reverse, take his checkbook out and write that check. It was his tithe and his offering. My dad didn't just tithe and give when it was easy. He was faithful to God, but it wasn't. When I saw my dad write that tithe check when it was tough, and I knew, I was old enough to know, I was college age at the time. High school age. How old I was, mom knows. <laughs> you know what I said? This is real. This is real. This is real. This is real. Praise God. So preach where did it all start? I'll tell you where it started. When dad got saved. I was just a little boy. Two, three years old, however old I was. Mom knows how old I was. <laughs> I'm giving her a hard time today. I love you, Mom. I love my dad. I want to be honorable to them. I'm thankful that they made it easy to be honorable. Thankful for the consistent life that they live in front of us. That's how I want to live for my kids. I want my kids to see that I'm real. Am I going to mess up? <laughs> you better believe it. I'm glad there's a God that can forgive. Amen. My other kids will forgive too. Oh, that's all right. That's all right, Dad. Praise God. Love them. Lift them. Limit them. Lead them. Amen. Do those things. May God help us. The power has your prayer. Heads bowed. Eyes are closed this morning. May this morning.